Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. As Brother Zook comes to minister tonight, let's just magnify the Lord. Lift up your voice. Oh, can we just do that? Could you just shout unto the Lord tonight? Oh, could we give the Lord a shout of praise and a hand clap of praise if you think you got it in you tonight to jump up and down and shout and give the Lord some praise? Oh, could we just worship the name of Jesus tonight? Oh, we're the people of the Most High God. There's a lot going on in this world, but we have the name of Jesus. We have the answer. If you're happy about what God is doing, if you're happy to have the Holy Ghost, if you're happy to have the blood of Jesus applied to your life, would you shout and give the Lord the praise to His name? Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, blessed be the name of Jesus. Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord tonight. I had a little bit of a dream the other night that I didn't, I didn't really get to preach because the Spirit of the Lord began to move. So if you feel it in the Holy Ghost, just let go and let God. I know it's just a Wednesday night. I know we've been through work and we're tired. I am too. But God is worthy. God is worthy to be praised. Even on a Wednesday night, even after you've given everything to the job, even after you feel like going to bed, God is still worthy to be praised. Amen. I'm excited for a new year to serve the Lord. I'm excited for what he's doing. I'm excited for what he's prophesied and spoken into this church. And it's high time we start embracing the promises of God. Amen. There's been a couple of years of difficulty. I know it's been rough. I know people have been down. I know people are sick. I know people are no longer with us anymore in this earth. But God is still working. God is still moving. God is still speaking to a church. And there are still lost souls in this city that need to be reached. Amen. Amen. So I'm just going to do a little bit of preaching tonight because I feel I want to set the tone for this year. And I felt confirmation last week as I already had this thought kind of on the back burner, thinking about it. And then we got verses and theme and everything all coordinated, and I didn't even know it, but God had coordinated it. So this is almost going to be like a part two of last week because that's just what God had in store. Amen? So I'm going to let go and let God. I'm not the type of person to say, well, a little bit of that was already preached last week, so I'm just going to ignore it. No, I believe confirmation was given, and I believe the Lord wants to speak tonight. Amen. It was that good. We're going to go to the book of 1 Chronicles, chapter 17. I realized I marked chapter 7 in my Bible, so that's not correct. Praise God, 10 chapters behind. This was referenced last week, but David had a desire after he was king to make some remodeling adjustments to the house of God, to take it from a tent into a permanent structure. And at first Nathan said, yeah, go ahead, It's, it's God's will. And then God said, wait a minute, Nathan, go back for a minute here. There's a little clarification I need to give here. David, you're not going to be able to build it. But here, I'm going to pick up in verse 7 here. It says, Now therefore thus shalt thou say unto my servant David, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I took thee from the sheepcote 
even from following the sheep, and that you should be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you've walked, and I've cut off all your enemies from before you, and I've made the name like the name of the great men that are in the earth. Also, I will ordain I will ordain a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them. I'll plant them, and they shall dwell in their place and shall be moved no more. Sounds like David's plan for the house of God, but he had a little something different in store. Neither shall the children of wickedness waste them anymore as at the beginning. And since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, moreover, I will subdue all thine enemies. Furthermore, I will tell thee that the Lord will build thee a house. And it shall come to pass that when thy days be expired and you go to be with your fathers, that I will raise up thy seed after thee, which shall be of thy sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son, and I will not take my mercy away from him as I took it from him that was before thee. But I will settle him in my house and in my kingdom forever, and his throne shall be established forevermore. I just want to preach from this thought tonight, my house is your house. Jesus, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the moving of the Holy Ghost in this place tonight. I thank you for your precious people that are gathered here together tonight. I ask that you would speak. Lord, let there be unity in the spirit. And I pray, Lord, that you would go before and prepare the hearts of all those that hear this word tonight, Lord. I pray that you'd speak and convict us. Let us leave here changed with a renewed passion and fervor for the things of God. Lord, establish this house and your people tonight in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may all be seated tonight if you love the Lord. You see, David had a plan to build the house of God, and as a result of that, God said, no, wait a minute, David, I'm going to establish your house and your son's house, and it will be established forevermore. He will settle in my house. You see, investing in the work of God has always provided for his people. When they invest in what he's doing, he takes care of them. Goes the whole way back to the Garden of Eden. He said to Adam and Eve, take care of the garden. I just want you to take care of this. You got one rule, don't break it. And take care of the garden. And they didn't, think about this. They didn't have to worry about where the next meal was coming coming from. They didn't have to worry about shelter. They didn't have to worry about refuge. They didn't have to worry about hot and cold and the seasons and the snow and all that kind of stuff. All they had to do was take care of the garden. All they had to do was invest in the work of God. Invest in what he had done. And everything was provided for them. And now we have the word of God and preaching and, and all that because they, they couldn't keep that commandment in the easiest state that mankind has ever been in. So that's why we are where we are. But And, and, and watch this too. And this is the way, even from the beginning, everything still works the exact same way. Satan came... That serpent came up to Eve and he started to try to put a wedge between what God had asked them to do and what they wanted to do and their egos and what they felt they, they wanted out of life. He began to speak to Eve and she got this concept, well, you know what, I really shouldn't have to do all of that. I shouldn't have to do the work. The easiest job in the world, just take care of the garden and you're good. But no, she said, I shouldn't have to do this. I can be like God. You're right. I can do that. And she took of the fruit. 
And then Adam took of it with her. And this, again, this is the same pattern. So the devil tries to put a wedge between you and the work of God. And then once he's done that, terrible things happen in your life. And then you start blaming each other. I've watched it happen over and over. They both take of the fruit, and now they're saying, oh, because of the serpent, oh, because of the woman that you gave me. And, and they try to put a way, he tries to put a wedge in between the people of God. And I just want to say this from the outset before I get any further in what I'm saying tonight. We need to make sure that we're cautious of what the enemy tries to speak into our lives. We need to be cautious. Every thought that enters into our head that's to the to perspective of I shouldn't have to do this for God. I shouldn't I shouldn't have to do this work. I shouldn't have to show up. I shouldn't have to take care of my brother. Am I my brother's keeper? That's where it goes. And so we need to be careful about that. Because that's the way the enemy works. But all they had to do was take care of the things of God and he provided for them. Even Noah, he, he had to work on the ark. And that was his only mission. That's the only thing he had to worry about. And you know, he didn't have any of the modern conveniences like washers and dryers and dishwashers and all that kind of stuff to help out with the daily chores. He still had to take care of everything and build an ark in his spare time on top of it all. But he knew that if he took care of that ark, that God would take care of him. He knew that if he took care of that ark, he would be safe. He knew that he wouldn't have to worry about anything else because if he took care of that ark, God would take care of him. The same could be said for Abraham. God told him, come out from everything that's familiar. Get away from your family, your friends, everybody that you know, everything that's familiar, everything that's comfortable, and follow after my word. Go ahead, Abraham. And he walked, the Bible says later in Hebrews, says he, he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God. You see, he didn't have to lay a single brick, but he looked for a city that was being built for him, a place where he was going to be able to dwell because he followed after and did the work of God. And there was a promise of a house that was going to be built for him. Because when we make his house our house, when we make his house our work, it becomes our house. And we finally get to Moses. The Lord instructs him to build the tabernacle, the house of God. And the people come all over. Israel comes bringing gold and silver and precious stones. So much to the point we've talked about it before. But they, so much to the point they said, stop coming, it's too much. Man, that'd be a good place to be where the people of God just said, we're going to keep bringing it until it's too much. We're going to keep investing until it's too much. Amen. <laughs> I thank God we have a good giving church. Praise God. I'm not being hard on anybody. I thank God that we have people that love the kingdom of God, that invest in the church, invest in the kingdom of God, and invest in what God is doing. Amen. But that tabernacle was the central focus of all the camp of Israel. You see, when God set everything up, he said, he didn't say, put the entrance in the back of the camp to worry about the problems and the invasions and the things that might go wrong. He didn't say, put it along the side so that you can watch your neighbor and make sure that they're doing the right thing and taking care of them. He said, no, 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 put the entrance of that tent. When you walk out in the morning, if you need to walk out in the middle of the night, you can see the tabernacle. And when they, they walked out in the morning, the first thing they saw was the presence of God in that pillar of cloud that was there hanging over the tabernacle. If they woke up and they had a restless night and everything was pitch black, they could walk out, open that tent door, and see the pillar of fire and know that God was still shining bright in the midst of everything, in the midst of the darkest night. 
And so it should be the central focus of the church, the work of God. Not, not so much looking into what's going to come our way and how we're going to handle the next issue or the next situation or the next problem. Not looking to the side and seeing, oh, I'm, I want to make sure they're doing the, the right thing. And, oh, did you see so-and-so messed up or they did this or they made this mistake? No, we need to be focused on the work of God. And so from this, there was something that David got from this. He had a love for the things of God. And he looked at this and said, you know what? I, the nation's getting a little bit bigger. We're in the land now that you promised us, Lord. We're not just an encampment anymore. I want to make this a little bit bigger. I want to give glory to you. Look at my beautiful house. And, and the Lord is here in a tent. I want to make this bigger and do something for God. And God didn't allow him to build it, but he said, you know what, David, I respect that. I know what you're trying to do, and just, you know, the heaven of heavens can't contain me, just so that you're aware that it's not going to hold me back at all, just so you're aware that I'm not just restricted to those four walls, that I'm going to let you build it. I'm going to let you do something. I'm going to let you invest in my kingdom, David. Your son will build this and I'll establish his throne forever, and I will settle him in my house, the Lord said. And with this promise, with this promise that David was given, he begins to make plans. Plans for the, the, tab, or the, the temple that could be built. He didn't even have a guarantee, but he just had to walk by faith that his son was going to build this and the Lord was going to establish him and just in that faith of something that he would never see, in that faith of something that he would never see built, he had a promise that God had given him and he began to think about it. I, I just can imagine it kind of consuming him as he went to bed at night. Now how much bigger should I make this? I wonder how much gold could fit on this wall here. I wonder what I could do, how great, how incredible I could make this for the Lord. So much to the point that even Solomon caught a little bit of that love that David had for the house of God. He caught a little bit of that love that David had for the working of the ministry, of the sacrifice, of worship. Compared to the temple, or sorry, rather compared to the tabernacle, the temple that Solomon ended up building was twice as big as far as area, three times the height of the tabernacle, but he made that altar four times as big as the original altar because he realized there was something there, something he learned from his daddy, so many years of investing in the kingdom that there needed to be a big area for sacrifice. There needed to be plenty of room for people to be able to come and to give things to the Lord, to invest in the work of the kingdom. When our focus becomes his house, he will establish our house. Solomon, known as the wisest man that ever lived, richest man that ever lived, all the God's blessings that he had given him. And I don't think it's any coincidence that he built this beautiful temple, this house of God. There was a sensitivity that he had toward the things of God. Unfortunately, his end did not reflect his beginning, but his beginning was a love for the things of God. Jesus said, he that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, he will be like a man that built his house on a rock. His house, you get it? His house was established on a rock. When you hear what God's speaking into your life, when you see what God's doing in the church, when you see the vision of reaching the lost, when you see the commitment and the dedication that it takes and you say, I don't care. I'm just going to do whatever it takes to invest in the kingdom of God. I don't care what it's going to cost me. I don't care how much it's going to hurt. I don't care how many years of my life are going to be spent doing the work of God. That's going to be my focus because that will be the rock on which your house is founded. His house will establish your house. 
And I'm thankful to have this place where we can get together. I'm thankful to have this place. A lot of people say, well, you don't have to go to church to be saved. Well, okay, that's true. But it is a reflection of how you feel about the things of God. There are people that spend thousands of dollars and get season passes to go to these sporting events that they don't have to to say that they're a sports fan. They could just watch it on the TV at home. But they're they're so into it that they just want to be there around those people, hear the crowd cheering, seeing all the people rooting for the team, seeing that touchdown live, smelling the grass, being around other people that love it. And that's why we have this place. That's why we have this place together because I believe there's a people, a group of people here in this area that love being with the people of God, that love being in the house of God, that love to be able to feel the Holy Ghost when it moves, love to be able to watch as God begins to work and begins to heal and begins to change lives. No, it's not the only place that it can happen. It's not the only place somebody can be filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not the only place where somebody can be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. But it's the only place that sole purpose is those things. And that's why we have it. It's the only place whose purpose is those things. There's no other place where you can go and say, I'm going just to worship Jesus, just to see people baptized in his name, just to see people filled with the Holy Ghost. There's no other place that you can go that that's your only goal in mind. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm thankful for the people that invest in this place, that invest in the work of Of the kingdom. The grass doesn't cut itself. The church doesn't clean itself. But there's people that invest in the kingdom. That invest in those things. And their reward is in heaven. Because they don't look for recognition. I just... I just want to honor some people and I won't call your names just so that recognition can be in heaven. <laughs> we appreciate the work that's done in this house because the investment that's done without any thought of accolades or praise. Right. Read all of Matthew chapter 6. It talks about it. What you do in secret, God will reward you openly. When you make his house your priority, he will bless your life. And I just want to focus to that end on three areas of our lives here this evening. The first, I'll just start out with the heavy one and talk about finances. I know it was mentioned last week, but I just want to say with the outset of this that Jesus said not to lay up for yourselves treasures on the earth where moth and rust corrupt and where thieves can break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Nothing can corrupt the things that are in the kingdom of God. (laughs) Nothing can steal away the experience of teaching someone a Bible study and seeing them get the revelation (laughs) of the oneness of God, a baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, the infilling of the Holy Ghost as they see the words on the page of the word of God light up in front of them. Nothing can replace watching a friend or loved one baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, watching their life change. Nothing can steal it away. Nothing can steal away when you're filled with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, with the evidence of speaking in other tongues like they did on the day of Pentecost. Nothing can steal away that experience. Nothing can steal away the joy unspeakable and full of glory. Nothing can steal away the peace that passes all understanding. Jesus talks of a man that began to prosper and 
had these barns full of of things that he had harvested. And he said, you know what? I'm going to tear down everything and I'm going to build bigger barns. And Jesus said, well, that was kind of dumb. Because this soul is your night, is this night is your soul required of you. He said, someone like that, that is the end of someone who has treasure for their self. And they're not rich toward God. Matthew 6, it mentions this, take no thought for tomorrow what you're going to eat, what you're going to put on, what you're going to wear. We don't have to worry about all those things. It says, who of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit to your stature? (laughs) Didn't work. (laughs) But what he's saying is this. We we can't think about tomorrow and what's going to happen. It didn't say, you know, don't plan and prepare and don't be smart. It didn't say that. It just said, you don't have to dwell on it. Because you can think for hours about what's going to happen the next day, and it might not happen anyway. And then that's hours of your life that you're never going to get back because you wasted it thinking about what you thought might happen. And we don't have to worry. Whenever we invest in the kingdom of God, he he said, consider the lilies. They don't toil. They don't spin. They don't do anything to try to take care of themselves. But he, he mentioned Solomon. He said, even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. He said, going the whole way back to Solomon, who had all those riches and all that wisdom, the blessings of God, the one who built that beautiful temple, even he was not arrayed like just these small flowers that are here that God clothes. The grass of the field that gets right there and then is burned in the furnace. He said, your father knows what you have need of before you even ask. My children don't have to worry about going and and working a job and trying to find where food's going to be at. and They don't have to go out hunting and and get a deer and get some nice bologna that just is really delicious. Sorry. Um, (laughs) Or two if you miss. They don't have to worry about any of those things. All they have to say is, Daddy, can I have a block of cheese? Or something. Or whatever they want. They just have to come up and ask. But even before that, I'm usually already making something or we're already making something for dinner or providing something because we know. We know that they're hungry. And so why do we have to worry so much? Let me tell you, I just want to encourage somebody tonight. When you make the work of God and the house of God your focus, when you make his house your focus, when you make the work of God your focus, you don't have to worry about all these other things. When you're investing in the one who owns it all, who has it all, <coughs> who can provide it for it all, you don't have to worry. How much easier is it to go to the one who has it all than to try to go figure it out for yourself? Come on. Praise God. But he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. I go back to the garden. It's just a simple thing. Just take care of the garden and you don't have to worry about anything else. Let's just take care of the kingdom. Let's take care of the kingdom of God. Let's worry about what God is doing. Let's worry about the mission of reaching the lost. Let's worry about taking care of what he has asked us to do. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and all these things are added unto you. And you see the kingdom of heaven. You see I have a lot of preface here before I actually get into talking about the money part. So the kingdom of heaven is counterintuitive, all right? We spend a lot of time and a lot of effort and have as a civilization and a society trying to work out all the details of everything. We know the force of gravity. We know calculus and and all those different types of things. Brother Juwan, thank you. (laughs) We know the, the specific temperature of the sun, the distance between the sun and the earth and the moon and 
or some people do. <laughs> we can calculate all of these things that have been written down, chemicals that can be put together, medicines, all these different things. We know how they work. And so we become so inclined to do the same thing with the kingdom of God. And if we have a a need or a struggle or a problem, we think, well, it could only work out if A, B, and C came together and this worked out at this time and then this person showed up and then I could do this and then maybe if this happened, then if all that came together in this, just this beautiful, perfect little ball of of wonderful. Where did that come from? (laughs) You can use that. If all those things could come together, <laughs> praise God, then, then, maybe, then maybe this could, this could happen. Even if God could make windows in heaven, could this happen? So it's counterintuitive. See, there's, there's a, a thing that, that the world doesn't get with all that intellect, and that's faith. Because there's, there's a certain... There's a certain level of understanding you don't get except by faith. And we need to walk by faith, the Bible says, not by sight. We need to walk not by what we can see or what we can understand, not in all the complex concepts that are out there and all the possibilities of how we think something could happen, but by faith in the Word of God. And, and just, just to the level of belief of, you know what, if I try it, if I just do what these words say, then I believe that something good is going to happen. I believe that if I do what God says, says then I'll get what he said then I'll get and if you could just have the faith to step forward and do that you can see how the kingdom of God works so now I get into this Malachi says this of God he says let me bring all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house bring it to my house Build up my house with tithe and offering. Malachi talks about bring it to the kingdom of God. Bring it to the house of God and see if I won't pour out a blessing that you can't even contain the blessing that I'm going to pour out. If you could just bring it all to me, if you could give it to me, Lord, I don't have it to give. Well, give it to me anyway, he said, and see what happens. See what I could do. Prove me, he says. Prove me. I've shared this story before, but I just, I, I'll share it again just for those that haven't heard some personal experience. And, and I, I share this only to say that I, I do practice what I preach. <laughs> but I remember when my wife and I first got married, we were kind of in a financial situation where if we added up the numbers, it was going to be negative every month. So I decided what we would do to solve that problem was to double what we were given in offering. And then the Lord provided, and we didn't have to go negative in our finances. How does that work? I don't know. And then things started to get a little rough again. I hadn't changed that amount, and then I decided, well, I'll just double it again. And God provided. Prove him. Prove the word of God. If you're struggling, if you need provision, if you need God to work, just give to him. It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in my head how this can work. But God is above making sense. It's a level of faith that you need to have to understand how much the Lord wants to bless you. If you'll just trust him and have faith. Praise God. He said, give, and it shall be given unto you. That doesn't make any sense. How can I give and have it given back to me? It doesn't make any sense. But by faith, we know that God is faithful to his word. We know that he is true. And he just says, give. And then it will be given unto you. Good measure. Pressed down. Shaken together. Running over. Will men give unto you? Why? Just because you gave. <laughs> Who praise God. Oh, can we just give the Lord some praise tonight? 
If he's ever provided for you, if he's ever done something for you, if he's ever come through in that situation, oh, can we just praise the Lord for a moment tonight? Oh, I thank you, Jesus, for your promises, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus. That's investing in the house of God. The Bible also says about not any man, every man not seeking his own but another's wealth. So here's another concept. If you're having some struggles, bless somebody else. It works. It works. I promise you it works. <laughs> That's the kingdom of God. That's investing in the house of God. So that's our finances. I'll move on. The next is our family. Because I know we all have family that we want to see. And again, this is going back to the concept here that if we invest in the kingdom of God, if we invest in his house, he'll establish and he'll take care of our house. People came to Jesus one day and they said, Jesus, your, your mother and your, your brethren are, are out there waiting for you. Come on out and it's your mother and your brethren. And he said, well, who are my mother and my brethren? Everybody that hears the word of God and does it, that's my mother and my brethren. What he's saying is, <laughs> well, we just talked about Mary and, and Joseph and we talked about all that during Christmas time, and Jesus said, you know what? What's more important to me is investing in these people that want to hear the word of God. Let the chips fall where they may. But he said, that's my mother and my brother. That's my family. Those are the people that I want to invest in. And he takes care of us. He said, not, not a single person that's given up family or houses or land or anything shouldn't receive in this life a hundredfold in life to come everlasting. We're promised that if we invest in his house, if we invest in his kingdom, he will bless us. Uh, Matthew 25, talk, they, he talks about those that, he said, when I was naked, you clothed me. I was in prison. You came to visit me. I, I needed Someone to be there. You came. You, you helped me out. You, you did all this for me. And they said, Lord, we didn't know. How did we do that for you? And he said, in so much as you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren. Who's his mother and his brethren? The people that hear the word of God and do it. He said, in so much, if you've done it, if you've tried to bless somebody else in the kingdom of God, if you try to bless somebody else in the house of God, if you've reached out to somebody and said, hey, I want to give you a hand up. I want to work with you. I want to pray with you. I want to be there for you. Do you need somebody to pray with you? I'll be there. I'll take care of you. I'll visit you if you're in need. He said, if you do that, you've done it to me. And it's the consistency that wins our families. I believe it's Paul mentions it. The uh, Basically the lifestyle of the wife can with that lifestyle, with her conversation is the word it's used in the King James, can win her husband. And again, I don't believe that's relegated. I don't believe it's relegated to just husband and wife, but any familial relationship, I believe that the way we live, the way we do things for God, it will eventually get noticed. It will eventually become apparent that there's something real. It will eventually become clear to them that what we have is more than just a passing phase, but that something is different. Something is powerful in our lives. The prodigal son, he had gone out, he had wasted everything. But once everything had been gone, everything was gone, he, he knew where to go. Why did, how did he know where to go? Because the father never moved. He was still there. He was still there in the house. 
And he understood, <laughs> he understood even the people that are not family, even the people that aren't in the house, just the people that are blessing his house, the servants that are working in the fields and doing the Father's work, even the ones that are investing in his house, they don't have to worry about anything. See, that's a kingdom concept. If we're working for the house of God, if we're doing the work of God, we don't have to worry about what we're going to eat, what we're going to wear, where the next meal is going to come from, where the finances are going to come from. He said even the servants don't have to worry about it. And he knew where to go because his father was still standing there waiting for him. We don't have to move. We don't have to compromise. We don't have to go and, and, and just bend a little bit this way or do that. We can stand firm on the word of God. We can stand firm on our convictions. We can stand firm on what God has given us. And they will know where we are. I know we give the older brother a lot of grief because he did kind of have a bad attitude, but the father comes to him and says, you know what? You've been here the whole time, so everything I have is yours. Again, that's a kingdom concept. If we can stay in the house, stay working for the kingdom of God, stay investing in the house of God, everything, think about it, everything that a father has to offer is ours to have, is ours to receive from him. Praise God. So when we stay consistent, when we invest in the kingdom, again, it doesn't make sense, but invest in the kingdom, invest in the family of God, and your family will be saved. I'm speaking it in faith in the name of Jesus Christ. I believe it that there's some restoration that's going to be happening this year and some blessing that's going to be happening this year in the kingdom of God. Not just because it's just going to be a special year where things just happen to happen like that, but because some people are going to get a burden to really dig in, to really invest in the kingdom of God. And who's to say that your investment in the kingdom will bring somebody else's family in? Come on, let's seek to be here for each other, to take care of each other, to work and to pray with each other. And see the blessings of God. So in our finances, our family, and then finally in our future. The Bible says that whatsoever man sows, that will he also reap. If you reap to the flesh, you receive things in the flesh. If you reap or sow in the spirit, you receive things in the spirit. Life everlasting, you receive these things. Whatever you're sowing, whatever you're investing in. So when you invest, come on, again, it's, it doesn't make any sense. It's counterintuitive. It doesn't make sense to our minds. But if you need something in this life, give it to the kingdom of God, what you have, and he'll provide it for you. It's as simple as that. Take care of the kingdom of God and <laughs> any, every worry, every concern, every fear, every doubt, it just melts away when we invest in the kingdom of God. He said, if you sow sparingly, you'll reap sparingly. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. And you know what? The kingdom of God is limitless. However much you want to invest into what God is doing, however much time and effort and money and, and strive, whatever you have to invest, whatever you sacrifice, to what level you do it, you will receive from the Lord. Because of the work of God's house, a David's dream, because of that desire and because of what Solomon built, people came from all over the world to see the beauty of God's house. 
I tell you, what you do for the kingdom of God matters. What you do in this building matters. What you do among these people matters because it can be seen. No, no, we don't have a huge building that's all made of, of gold and silver and all those things, but there's a spiritual aspect that is here in the Holy Ghost, and people can see it. We've had people turn in off the streets because they felt the presence of God and felt they needed to come in. You see, there's a beacon that goes out when the people of God get together and want to invest and want to unite and want to do the work of God. It was because of that temple Solomon made this request to God, if, if anything ever happens to your people, if they stray away, if they, if they go where they shouldn't go, if they pray toward where your presence is, if their mind becomes turned to the house of God and they begin to pray, will you hear them, Lord? Will you bring them back? Will you restore them? And after multiple ways of saying it and requesting it, God responds to Solomon. He said, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Because of the house that was built where God said, I've chosen to put my name there. I've chosen to put my name in that city and in that building, in Jerusalem and in that temple. I'm so glad we have a place where the name of Jesus is present. I'm so glad that we have a place where we can come together and the name of Jesus has been invested in this place, has been put into this place and been put into everything that we do. Thank you, Jesus. And it wasn't Solomon's temple, but because of, because of the concept of the temple and having more space, it ended up being Herod's temple. But the early church then had a place to gather and to preach Jesus and to worship God. It was the gate in that temple, the gate beautiful, where Peter and John would walk up to the lame man and said, We don't have silver and gold, but such as I have, give I you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise up and walk at that gate of the temple. They were daily in that temple preaching Jesus. Daily in that temple preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, it became the future. It became the future of what was happening. And then Paul would later say, don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? When, come on, there's, there's a holy way to live. There is a highway, the Bible said, that is called the way of holiness. And whenever we invest in what God has put in us, Paul said, whatever, whatever God saw in me, I want to get a hold of whatever he saw. I want to apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Jesus Christ. I want to invest in his house. I want to invest in his kingdom. I want to invest in the place where he has allowed his spirit to dwell. And it becomes our future. I'll be closing it here in just a moment. We can all stand. Jesus talks of a parable of the, the talents that were given. One man's given one, another two, another five. I just want to say too that it was, it was the same expectation of investment. There was, there was no. Oh, you, you're, you're five to ten. Well, that's that's a lot better than the guy that only got four. There was no extra. They weren't all expected to make ten. They were all expected to do what they had, what they could with what they had. The man that has one gets, you know, gets an attitude, buries it in the dirt. But those that, that had doubled it, I've talked about this already, but uh, they, they keep what they have. They retain the work that they had done. All the labor that they had that they thought was just 
just building up the kingdom of God, just doing another man's work. They just did it anyway. It didn't matter. Little did they know this was everything that they made, everything they invest, the treasure that they laid up for the kingdom of God, the investment they made in the house of God. They were able to take all of that with them into the joy of the Lord. What we do here in the kingdom of God, it seems like a sacrifice sometimes. But if we could just get a glimpse of eternity, if we could just get a glimpse of we're lucky to live 90 years on this earth, all that we attained and all that we were able to accumulate, we just enjoy for that time, if that, if we have the health to enjoy it. But all the sacrifice that we made in that span of time, we have all of eternity to enjoy. So if over half of your life is spent in sacrifice for the kingdom of God, that's over half of a lifetime worth of eternity to enjoy it. Jesus says, he said, in my father's house are many mansions. There's a place to reside in the father's house. He said, if it wasn't so, I would have told you. I'm preparing a place for you. To where I am, there you may be also. I can receive you because of the work and the investment that you made into my house. It's now become your house. And I'll settle you therein for eternity. I'll just close with this. You're a chosen generation. A royal priest of a peculiar nation. Holy nation. You can show forth the praises of him who's called you out of darkness into this marvelous light. He said, you're the the royal priesthood. You're the ones who are working in the house of God. That you can show forth his praises. That you can do his work and reap the blessings of the house of God. So I want to just challenge us with this this year. And to make this year about his house. To make this year about investing in the kingdom of God. About leaving some things behind. I know we're seeing a little bit of that with the media fast. What it feels like to leave some things behind. And it feels a little liberating, doesn't it? Let's just make that the attitude of this year. What things can I leave behind so that I can seek first the kingdom? We all have everyday things that we have to go through. But there's a kingdom that requires our attention and our investment, and it's for your future. It's for your family. It's for your blessing. I want to just open these altars tonight for anybody that wants to receive this, that wants to accept the call to invest in the house of God this year to see what he will do.